Good evening, I'm Susan Ormiston and this is The National. As world leaders flock to a global stage, Canadians cry out against targeted violence in Myanmar. This is not merely ethnic cleansing, this is far worse. Rising nuclear tensions also crowd the UN agenda. If the United States has to defend itself or defend its allies in any way, North Korea will be destroyed. British police make a second arrest in Friday's subway bombing. Plus, 10 years after the iPhone, is it indispensable or addictive? Our panel examines how it's changed us for better or worse. Whenever world leaders gather in one place, crisis is often on the agenda. And as presidents and prime ministers board planes bound for this week's UN General Assembly, it's not one crisis, it's two. North Korea, undeterred by sanctions and censure, commits a new act of nuclear brinksmanship seemingly by the week. Its collision course with the U.S. a global threat. And in Myanmar, Rohingya villagers describe a moment-to-moment -moment existence of terror, of ultimatums to leave their homes or die. Today, Canadians held rallies to sound the alarm on ethnic cleansing, joining an increasingly global call for action. Briar Stewart begins with that story. Heavy rain soaked the long lines of desperate refugees. Hundreds of thousands who fled for their lives now find themselves in a different kind of danger. The combination of this weather uh, and dirty water and lack of food um, and uh, a lack of a safe place to, to shelter is, is going to be, uh, bring about a humanitarian disaster unless we act very, very quickly. Over the last few weeks, more than 400,000 Rohingya have crossed into Bangladesh from Myanmar. The long persecuted minority is under violent attack. Official information is scarce and it's not clear how many have been killed. Based on the reports, this looks a lot like ethnic cleansing. Yesterday, Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister condemned the violence at a rally in Toronto, and today more events were held in Ottawa and Vancouver. We want justice! Stop killing! Yasmin Ola became a Canadian citizen last year, but some of her family members are still in Myanmar. All the villagers, uh, the Buddhist Rakhine people, have surrounded our villages, and they are ready to attack us anytime. Um, they have sworn, you know, that they are going to kill all, all of the Rohingyas. Some of the harshest words from this crowd are targeted at Myanmar's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, a Nobel Peace Prize winner. She was once praised for her push for democracy and human rights. Now she finds herself the subject of growing criticism. Thousands have signed a petition calling on Canada to revoke her honorary citizenship. Canadians want our government to take forceful action and meaningful action immediately. Suji will be addressing her nation next week. And in an interview with the BBC, the UN Secretary General says it will be a final chance for her to stop the attacks. She will have a chance to reverse the situation. If she does not reverse the situation now, then I think the tragedy will be absolutely uh, horrible. It's feared that if the violence doesn't stop, thousands more will find themselves stranded, stateless, and in increasingly dire conditions. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Ottawa has been speaking out about Myanmar. Chris Hall, CBC's National Affairs Editor, joins me. Chris, there is mounting pressure now for action on Myanmar. What is the Canadian government doing at this point? Well, as we know, they have uh, referred to what's happening to the uh, Rohingya Muslims as ethnic cleansing, and they're demanding access for our diplomats uh, in Myanmar to see the area, to monitor, and to report back. Both Christia Freeland and the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau are off to the United Nations, where uh, I'm sure they will be uh, uh, expressing the point that uh, really the military has to stop these operations, and in particular, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, has to respond to the global condemnation of what's been taking place. You know, this is a big week for the Prime Minister on the international stage at the UN. What are we expecting in addition to that? 
Well, first of all, he's meeting with Theresa May, the UK Prime Minister, here tomorrow. We'll talk about security and trade, particularly uh, with the Canada-EU trade deal taking effect uh, this Thursday. And then it's on to New York, where Wednesday, uh, the Prime Minister will be working behind the scenes, lobbying leaders of some of the smaller nations uh, for that UN Security Council seat that Canada wants to hold in 2021. Uh, As for his address, not much information so far available what he intends to say. Uh, The guessing is that he will push the idea of of, of the importance of progressive trade deals, of including gender equality, and much of the international development programs that the UN sponsors. And we'll be watching Christia Freeland as well, talking about North Korea and the efforts to try and get them to back away from the nuclear brinksmanship you referred to earlier. Uh, So we'll see what happens there. But certainly, uh, this is an opportunity for Canada to put its voice with the global communities to condemn North Korea, to talk about Venezuela, and certainly what's going on in Myanmar. And of course, we'll be watching Donald Trump, won't you, Chris? Uh, We will certainly be watching Donald Trump. (laughs) Thanks so much, Chris Hall in Ottawa. It is Donald Trump's first appearance at the world body and his Tuesday speech will arguably be his most important so far on the world stage. He's made it clear he's no fan of the UN, but he'll likely be calling for its support as he takes on North Korea. Paul Hunter has more on that. With its ever more advanced missile technology and apparent nuclear capability, North Korea is, for the moment, among the biggest security threats on Earth. But that hasn't stopped Donald Trump from boiling things down to 140 character shorthand. Today on Twitter, mocking North Korean leader Kim Jong-un as Rocket Man, and with international sanctions in place, noting long gas lines forming in North Korea. Too bad. And so as Trump prepares to speak at the United Nations this week, talk from his advisors hardens. This regime is so close now to threatening the United States and others with a a nuclear weapon that we really have to move with a great deal of urgency on sanctions, on diplomacy, and on preparing, if necessary, a military option. If the United States has to defend itself or defend its allies in any way, North Korea will be destroyed. And we all know that. And none of us want that. None of us want war. But Kim Jong-un warns the tests will continue, boasting that his military force now nears, as Kim put it, equilibrium with that of the U.S. And though Trump's tweet today was absent any specific threat of his own... North Korea, best not... Last month, he underlined, if North Korea keeps this up, they will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. As the U.S. now emphasizes it's running out of non-military options on North Korea, Trump's meetings next week at the U.N. will include the president of South Korea and the prime minister of Japan. And the U.S. is also expected to press hard for further sanctions, notably from long-standing North Korean ally China. We've said from the beginning, we don't have a lot of time left. We don't have a runway left to land this plane on. So we need China's assistance to bring them to the table. And with that, Donald Trump heads to the United Nations, an organization he's called WEAK. He'll arrive with no clear answers, facing an ever more defiant North Korea and ratcheted tensions all round. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Hundreds of people marched through the streets of St. Louis this evening. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. This was the third and largest day of protests against the acquittal of a white police officer charged in the shooting death of a black suspect. Demonstrators staged a die-in outside the St. Louis Police Department to send what they call a simple message. Stop killing us. It's as simple as that. Later, the crowd marched past a line of riot police peacefully. Demonstrations on Friday and Saturday turned violent after dark when smaller groups of protesters clashed with riot police and trashed local shops. More than 40 people were arrested. Well, in Florida, a week after Hurricane Irma hit, residents of the Lower Keys were finally allowed to return. Many spent the day assessing damage to their homes. Well, as you can see, the house is completely affected. No windows, no door, no roof. Everything is gone. It's a lot worse than we expected, a lot. Irma hit the Lower Keys as a Category 4 hurricane. Many homes and buildings were destroyed. 
There's no electricity, running water, or working sewage systems yet, and it could be weeks before they're all restored. But on Florida's mainland, life is slowly returning to normal. Electricity back on in about 90% of homes and businesses. And in Miami, schools are set to open tomorrow. But in the Caribbean, where rebuilding from Irma has barely begun, residents are bracing for another powerful storm, Maria. And tonight, Global Affairs is advising Canadians to avoid all travel to several places, including the U.S. Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, St. Martin, and other areas in the region because of Maria. It is churning in the Atlantic right now as a Category 1 hurricane, but it is gaining strength and seems to be following Irma's path, likely reaching the Lesser Antilles as early as tomorrow night. The intensity of recent hurricanes can be linked to global warming, and tackling climate change was the focus of an international summit in Montreal this weekend. Donald Trump has made it clear that he is pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Accord. But today, there were signs that his administration could shift its stance. Simon Nekonezhny has that story. We felt it was very important to show leadership. A day after leading a display of unity on climate change, Catherine McKenna was clearly feeling good. It's like, I was going to be like, you know, I never got to be a rock star, but now I'm going to try to do this in the climate world. The minister was given the star treatment at today's Global Progress Conference in Montreal. Uh, you had Pepsi, you had um, Mars. You McKenna had says U.S. big business is beginning to fall in line with the framework of the Paris Climate Accord. And she's hopeful the U.S. government will come around too. I'm just going to keep on just saying the facts and, uh, you know, doing whatever I can. I think the U.S. needs some space on this, so that's okay. But Donald Trump's U.S. national security advisor isn't budging. The president decided to pull out of the Paris Accord because it was a bad deal for the American people and because it, it, was, it was a bad deal for the environment. Secretary, welcome. But changed the channel and Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was striking a softer tone. We want to be productive. We want to be helpful. Tillerson says Trump may not cancel the accord after all. I think under the right conditions, the president said he's open to finding those conditions where we can remain engaged with others on what we all agree is still a challenging issue. Tillerson wouldn't elaborate on what those conditions might be, but said the U.S. position is being led by Trump's economic advisor, Gary Cohn. That presents an opportunity for Catherine McKenna, who now heads to New York for Climate Week. McKenna says one of her key meetings is with none other than Gary Cohn. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. Coming up. A summer camp welcomes trans kids to the great relief of their parents. This just seems like a really positive environment for the kids to just, you know, talk amongst themselves, just, you know, try on different personae. Plus, NDP leadership hopefuls make their final pitch to the party. Britain has lowered the terror threat level from critical to severe, a day after police arrested a second man in connection with Friday's bombing on a London subway. The device failed to fully explode, but still managed to injure 30 people. The CBC's Thomas Daigle is in London with the latest on the investigation. A rude awakening for a sleepy London suburb. Heavily armed police began their searches here in Sunbury on Thames, clearing the way for forensic experts to carefully comb for possible clues connected to an 18 year old suspect. Turns out it's the home of elderly foster parents Penelope and Ronald Jones. They've taken in so many children, including several refugees over the years. In 2009, the Queen honored them as members of the Order of the British Empire. She's fostered generations and generations of children, um, you know, and I've never known anyone more dedicated to the community and helping people. Near Heathrow Airport, meanwhile, another surreal scene for neighbours. The police cordon stayed up today, where late last night officers detained a second terror suspect, a 21-year-old man. He used to have his friends out there with his prayer mats and so forth, and that, but we didn't think nothing of it. We just thought he was a nice neighbour. After those arrests, British authorities felt confident enough today to downgrade the threat level from critical back to severe. 
but still leaving armed officers to patrol in transit hubs and on the streets. Now, severe still means that an attack is highly likely, so I would urge everybody to continue to be vigilant, but not alarmed. Authorities aren't saying how many they believe were involved in Friday's attack and have so far not charged either suspect. We know that 23,000 people in the United Kingdom on MI5's watch list. Uh, these people don't appear to have been on that watch list. That's why the threat level has to remain at severe. The five attacks on crowds in this country this year alone are a sign of the severity of the threat here, and police are reported to have foiled at least seven other plots. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, London. Four American college students had acid thrown at them today in Marseille, France. The attack happened in the city's main train station. Two of the young women were hit in the face. All four tourists were hospitalized, two for shock. A 41-year-old woman reportedly with a history of mental health issues has been arrested. French authorities say the incident does not appear to be an act of terrorism. Straight ahead, today's energetic finish to the NDP leadership race. You'll see who's courting different demographics in the party. And this is something else that's in use now and will one day be a part of every home. It's called the video phone. It's very simple to use. Pick up the dial, punch the buttons, And I just press a button, and here I see Lloyd. Hi. Hi, Sandy. And how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I can't see you yet. You can't see me? No. You can just punch up a button. There. Oh, there you are. See, there I'm right are. in front of the lens. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very good. But I can control this. If I'm off-center, you can't see me anymore. So, uh... You'd only want to do that if uh, you weren't properly dressed, though, wouldn't you? Right. So there'll be uh, no peeking at ladies when they're dripping wet and fresh from the tub. Hey, what's going on here? Hey, oh, what's your name? What are you doing? Je m'appelle Guillaume Lieberman et je crois le français. Oh, he says he's Willy Lieberman and he's uh, learning how to speak French. Well, tell me how this little machine works, Willy. Well, this is a teaching machine and it's very simple. Even an adult could use it. You see, in this box on magnetic tapes are 22 15-minute French lessons. Mm -hmm. So say I want lesson number five. I turn the dial and pull the switch. Yes. Now, after each phrase in French, there's a pause. So if I want, I can repeat the phrase into this microphone right here. Mm -hmm. And it will be recorded on another channel. Mm -hmm. Later, I can turn back and hear both myself and the teacher, and I can check my pronunciation. That's great. I say, uh, Willie, how would you like to have a nice, juicy hot dog? Oh, oui, monsieur. Oui, bon, très bien. Uh, Sandy, can we use your oven? By all means, go Oh, on. viens, mon vieux, on va manger quelque yeah, chose de bon. Oui, oui. Yeah. Lloyd, Willie's machine is not experimental. It's actually being used in schools today. Well, now here, Sandy, I see a very old and a very beautiful painting. It looks great, but I don't quite to see the point. What's this got to do with the future? Well, it is very beautiful, I agree, and, it, and it's real. It was painted by Albert Kuyp and it was painted in the 17th century and now hangs in the art gallery in Toronto. It's worth about $20,000. You see, some things won't change. Ovens and telephones and teaching aids make it newer and more progressive, but this painting represents something which is very dear to us, and that something, in a word, is art. After months of debates and campaigning, the NDP leadership race is entering its final stages. The four candidates vying to replace Tom Mulcair made their final pitches to party members today. And the CBC's Katie Simpson will break it down for us from Hamilton. For a campaign that's lacked excitement, today's leadership showcase was a refreshing change in tone. 
With a newfound levity and energy, all four candidates hit the stage and stayed on message. We're going to bring that change to Ottawa because this is our party. This is our movement. Charlie Angus cast himself as the working class guy connected to the grassroots, while Nikki Ashton is appealing to the millennial vote. Bold progressive politics is smart politics. Jugmeet Singh played up his perceived popularity, and Guy Caron says he's the man who connects in Quebec. When we win in Quebec, we win seats all across the country, because then we become a real progressive alternative everywhere in Canada. Gaining support in that province is a problem for the NDP, which was on full display this weekend at the party's caucus meeting. Il est charismatique, mais je pense tout de même. Quebec NDP MP Pierre Nantel is facing intense criticism after telling Radio Canada he thinks voters there won't identify with Singh since he wears a religious symbol, his turban. Visible religious attire is a divisive issue in Quebec, where legislators are debating a possible ban in the public service. But Singh says Quebecers are open-minded and it won't be an issue. I'm confident when it comes to the issue in general in Quebec that I can portray or convey my convictions that are convictions that are in completely in line with the values of the progressive social democratic spirit of Quebec. The NDP is desperate to regain support in Quebec after losing dozens of seats in the 2015 election. Navigating the sensitive issue of visible religious symbols will be one of the party's biggest challenges, no matter who wins. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Hamilton. And party members start voting for a new leader tomorrow. The results could be known anytime between October 1st and 15th, depending on the number of rounds of voting. Alan McEachan, the liberal politician known as the godfather of Cape Breton, was remembered today in Anaganish. Among those paying tribute to the former cabinet minister for his long service was Nova Scotia's premier and the prime minister. Whether they credit him or not, Canadians are living in the country that Alan J. built. The long-serving MP and senator died last week at the age of 96. During four decades in federal politics, McKechn was a strong advocate for social reforms such as Medicare and old age security. A Quebec man linked to an Amber Alert case involving a six-year-old boy remains in Ontario hospital tonight. It's not clear when 41-year-old Hugo Fredette will be discharged and transferred back to Quebec. Meanwhile, the owner of a vehicle used by Fredette is still missing. Today, police and volunteers searched areas near the town of La Chute for 71-year-old Yvonne Lacasse. Up next, it has been 10 years since a revolution that probably changed your life. This is what iPhone is, okay? We're gonna reinvent the phone. The latest technology raises new questions about your privacy. Our tech savvy panel will tell you what to watch out for.
September 26th at 8.30 on CBC. These are not three separate devices. This is one device. That was Steve Jobs in 2007. Of course, the smartphone had been around for years already. The most popular was the Canadian-made BlackBerry. But the invention of iPhone marked the beginning of a brand new age of technology. Ten years ago, we started a technological arms race to connect us faster, more simply, and smarter. Way smarter than any mobile device has ever been and super easy to use. This is what iPhone is. The smartphone took the world by storm, changing the way we think about almost everything. Privacy, human connection. Most of you have phones, uh, and uh, all you have to do is text BC Fires to 2222. Work, even love. Smartphones became status symbols or lifelines. They've even helped topple governments. That arms race never stopped. Today, tech is better and phones are smarter than ever. But are we really more connected? We must feel connected, since we spend more than five hours a day staring at that screen. My brother and sister-in-law had their iPhones and proceeded to give them to him, and he was enthralled forever. So ten years later, what have we gained? What have we lost? And what's coming next? All right, I'm joined by Kate Lunau, Canadian editor of Motherboard, and Kavukian, founder of Privacy by Design, and Daniel Bader, managing editor of Mobile Nations. They're all with me in Toronto tonight. So here's the thing. Facial recognition on this new iPhone, Galaxy 8 has it as well. You know, they told us that fingerprint was the best. Now they're saying facial recognition is the most secure. Is this a step forward or back, Anne? It's a step forward in terms of replacing pins and other identifiers. It's a very strong biometric, especially the way that Apple has configured it. Um, it is very uh, securely hashed, which is a mathematical algorithm that makes it very difficult to actually detect the biometric. The main problem that I've heard about with the facial recognition on the Apple is the fear that the bad guys or, you know, the, the police or border crossing people will go like this and just put the device to your face and get you to turn on the device that way, which could be an enormous problem. Indeed. Kate, how worried should we be about privacy with these new iterations of smartphones? It's a huge question, and it's definitely a really important one. As Anne said, when these devices were being announced, people were wondering if I'm asleep, can someone open my phone? Now, Apple says that you need to be attentive for the Face ID to work, which I think means you need to be looking at the screen. But still, we're going to be living in a world where our face becomes identification. Now, my face, as many other people's, is on the Internet. It's in photos everywhere. It's really a public presentation of myself to the world, unlike, say, a fingerprint or a pin. So that's something we're, going to, we're really going to need to consider going forward. Daniel, let's take a step back for a moment. Some people were surprised to learn that it's been 10 years since the iPhone emerged and changed many people's lives. What's happened to our psychology about connectivity with this iPhone and, and other smartphones? Right. So I think the iPhone and other smartphones have bridged the, the, the travel gap with, with millions of people. If you have somebody across the world you want to talk to, you can do it instantaneously from anywhere. But the concern psychologically is that it's actually stopped many people from communicating in person. It's, it's limited the time that people spend talking on the phone. And instead, we now text. We now use iMessage. And these are apps that, while incredibly um, powerful and allow us to express ourselves in many ways, are inherently limited. And there have been numerous studies showing that people are not quite as attentive to one another when they're in the same space because they have their phones on them at all times. Now, is that something widely believed or is this something like worried parents like me about my kid never talks to me eye to eye? <laughs> well, I think that there have, there, there have been actual studies to show that attention deficit is a growing problem among young people and among adults as well. And I think that the, the main thing here is that we just have to be cognizant of our attention. We think that we can multitask really well, but when we have our phone in our hand, it's really difficult to do so properly. Kate, what do you think? Are there areas that we should be worried about and working and sort of, you know, 
stepping up against uh, less connectivity with, with smartphones? I don't know that I would advocate for less connectivity. I value my connectivity highly. I think that sometimes we don't appreciate enough how amazing it is that we walk around the world with a very powerful computer in our pocket. That being said, there are issues. I mean, we are reachable anywhere that we go. There was a really interesting moment in the Apple keynote last week when they were unveiling these products and they used an Apple Watch to phone someone on a paddle board I mean, if people are going to be calling me when I'm on a paddleboard for meetings, like I'm not going to be very excited about that. But that's the world we live in now. That's what we can do for better or for worse. And Anne, what about our notion of privacy? Are we too complacent? Well, the whole issue with the smartphones and the connected devices is it ushered in an era of surveillance because no longer is your smartphone just a phone that you call people with. Once someone has access to your smartphone, it opens the door, it is the gateway to all of your personal information in terms of potentially your financial records, your banking information, your personal health records, your medical data, where you go during the day and to whom uh, you converse, and all of these connections, this whole new era of information, personally identifiable data, very sensitive, is now potentially accessible to anyone who can access your smartphone. So it's not just a phone, obviously. It is a device that could potentially engage in massive surveillance, and that's in fact what we're, what we're seeing these days. It's curious now, you know, we've lived 10 years with um, the new smartphones and what they're able to do, and they get enhanced every year, it seems now. But Daniel, are we coming to a point where there's going to be another big leap in technology uh, to do with smartphones. Yeah, so the the smartphone as a as a device, as a product has has largely matured to the point where there probably won't be major design leaps going forward. I think the main thing is that it's now a consolidator for so many other things in our lives. There's no longer a need for a separate camera, for instance. Um, the cameras on our phones are fantastic. And I think the next big thing is augmented reality and virtual reality. These are products that have uh, proliferated over the past couple of years by the attention that they've received from, from Apple and from Google, respectively. AR especially has been given a ton of uh, of press in the last couple of months over Apple's new AR kit feature, which allows you to literally augment the the, the camera, the, what your camera sees in front of it with digital information overlays. And it's quite something to see in real life. Tim Cook, I was reading something he said about augmented reality uh, recently, and he says it's as big an idea as the smartphone was back 10 years ago. I mean, they're really looking at augmented reality as the next big deal. Um, how fast and how much will it change things, Kate? It really positions our phone as this mediator. I mean, it already is one, but between us and the environment that we're in, you know, there are examples of apps that are out now and more that are coming where you're looking at your phone and you can see the stars in the sky, they're really there and it can tell you, you know, what constellations are there. You're watching a sports game and you shine your phone at one of the players and you get all the stats. So it really, again, it just, it positions our phone as this thing that augments and accentuates the environment around us, which is pretty amazing. Can you just explain, help me out with that, AR versus VR? So VR, virtual reality, is sort of you immersed in a 360 virtual environment. Augmented reality is more something like, if people remember Pokemon Go last year, <laughs> right? You're looking on your screen and you can see, I could see Pokemons in the newsroom if I were playing this right now, but I'm still, you know, I'm here. I'm seeing it on my screen. Okay, and you, I saw you wanted to jump in there. Well, I want to I wanna bring people back to the reality of the smartphones and the connected devices that are increasing with the Internet of Things that are happening right now, and the fears associated with that in terms of the massive potential for um, what I call unex unintended consequences. All of these devices are intended to help and do what we want them to do, but in the wrong hands, the potential for surveillance and others getting access to your information is enormous. So what we need to develop is we need to embed privacy and security into the design of all of, the, all of these new technologies and these new devices so that the individual can exert greater control over the uses of his or her personal information. And that's, that's going to take gonna be advocacy, critical. isn't it? 
advocacy like never before. I've started a new international council called the Global Council for um, Global Privacy and Security by Design, precisely because we have to globally get interest on how to embed privacy and security into these devices and return control to the individual. That's where it belongs. Daniel, a minute left or so. Are we headed into a brave new world that's uh, uh, good, progressive and exciting, <laughs> or should we be worried about some of this? We should absolutely be worried, but it, it is incredibly exciting. There is nuance to everything we're talking about here. I think Anne is absolutely right. People have to advocate for their own privacy, but the first thing people have to do is realize that security on their device is is important and is uh, is possible through things like biometrics, like fingerprint and yes. facial recognition, and through two-factor authentication, which is something that is completely underutilized in our society, and, th and, and we have to take responsibility for that. Um, but it also, you know, phones are the vector to everything else, and as a result, they could be the single point of failure, but they are also the most exciting breakthrough in technology in, in recent modern history. Well, it's become our everyone, everything for, for many of us. Thanks so much for wading through some of this, all three of you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Coming right up. You're going to make me cry, but it's, it's not hard to see that a lot of our campers are really looking for love and respect. At a camp in northern Ontario, trans kids have a safe place to figure out who they are. It has been a wet and deadly 36 hours in northeastern Quebec. All day, local radio has been warning people in dozens of specific areas to leave their homes. And if they can't drive out, signal helicopters flying overhead so they can be flown out. At least seven people are dead, several more are missing, and thousands more have been forced to flee. A minister in the Quebec government described the situation in this region as apocalyptic, catastrophic. For more than a day, torrents of water have crashed through villages, towns and cities, taking houses, in some cases entire buildings with it. Like clockwork, every five minutes a helicopter lands, bringing refugees from the flood. This is what they are escaping, hundreds of homes drowning in mud, hanging by a thread or giving in to the relentless river. No one knows how many bridges and roads have collapsed and the landmarks wiped out. This old pulp mill reopened as a museum just two weeks ago. Now it's a six million dollar write-off. This disaster is unprecedented in Canada and so is the relief fund, the largest ever collected by the Red Cross. The money has come from people all over the country, and this region knows it. Same with the destruction. The cars buried under mud, the homes swept out into the river, whole neighborhoods gone. That one house with the now famous foundation that alone resisted. Things people here will never forget, their disaster and the charity of others. Good evening, it's official now. The F-18A has won the fighter plane contract. The winning McDonnell Douglas 18A will cost $15 million a copy and is almost certain to be a highly controversial buy. General Dynamics, makers of the F-16 and the losing company in this competition has issued a statement saying the benefits it offered were higher than the government gave it credit for and that the price of the plane the government has bought will go up because of continued problems with it. For all of its weaponry, the toughest battle the F-18 Hornet may ever have to face is the barrage of poor publicity it's now attracted. Its costs have been climbing and some media reports have described the Hornet as a lemon. Earlier this year, the U.S. General Accounting Office blasted the plane. It was nearly a ton overweight, its undercarriage was faulty, it had problems of drag, reduced engine thrust, range, and its acceleration was below specification. Canada now has nearly 40 of them and expects to buy 100 more. Each of them costs 30 to 40 million dollars. Today it was revealed that the CF-18 and its American cousins of the United States Navy have the same problem. Cracks have started to appear in the tail section when the fighter does the combat maneuvers it was designed to do. It's a relatively minor 
uh, problem. It's one that is readily identifiable. The cause is known. This latest fault is sure to add to the criticisms of those people who felt that Canada should have bought many more of a competing aircraft, a fighter that came with a much lower price tag. You think Canadian history is boring? Well, it's not. Canadian history is filled with blood and guts and explosions and adventures. And that's just Parliament Hill in the 1970s. Rick Mercer hosts Just for Laughs, Breaks a Little Hell, Tuesday at 8 on CBC. At home, I feel like people are going to look at me for wearing like wacky colors of makeup, but here it's like the norm to be whoever you are and however you want to express yourself. It's a universal truth. Everyone wants to belong somewhere. And if you're a teenager exploring gender identity, that somewhere might feel as far away as Mars. But we found it in a summer camp. Sure, it's got bonfires and canoeing and crafts, but Rainbow Camp has something else. It's a place to be, well, just be. The CBC's Joanna Romiliotis explains. It's a cold morning, and this one begins like every other. Groggy teens and their counselors huddled around a homemade rainbow flag. All right, send some warmth, send some warm, some warm positive energy to the Maybe flag. Maybe if we send them warmth, it'll be warm today. Creating, too, their intentions for the day ahead. Just standing on this ground. Yeah. Yes, there's more than a whiff of mindfulness here. Rainbow Camp is all about self-awareness and unabashed affirmations. Nestled in northern Ontario on the shores of Lake Huron, Rainbow Camp was set up five years ago to give LGBTQ kids a place to connect with themselves and each other. It quickly became a haven for teenagers often struggling with their sexuality and now more than ever, their gender identity. Okay. All right. Whoa, go, 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 whoa, go, 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 go. Lovely. The biggest change with the amount of um, uh, trans uh, kids that we have. We've gone from just having a couple to um, last week I'd say it was about between 95 and 98 percent trans. Harry Stewart created the camp because he wished there was a place like it for him when he was a young man coming out. What is it that they need the most when they come here? Love. You're gonna make me cry but it's it's not hard to see that a lot of our campers um, are really looking for love and respect. And I'm not saying they're not getting that at home, but then in their community, um, there's a, a danger and just, you know, hiding. I mean, I, we're only 50 miles away from Sault Ste. Marie, and my husband and I, we, we don't hold hands anywhere. It just doesn't feel safe. So I just look at these kids and just think, for them, it's got to be that much harder. The shift to more trans campers may be due to more awareness about being trans and the fact there's no camp like this in Canada where the focus is to simply have fun. Like most camps, there's swimming and canoeing and bog runs, but not much else is typical. Kids are assigned to cabins by age, not gender. Bathrooms are not gender specific. And everywhere, messages of empowerment. This is an extraordinary opportunity to step further into emerging identities or to simply try one on. Beyond the manicures, a special workshop, Make Up with Maya, a Toronto drag queen. Fourteen-year-old Max Yemelyanov's identity is still fluid. He was born a girl, 
but now says he identifies as a boy. This is Max's second time here. He's from Virginia. This was the closest to what he was looking for, a place to just be. What's been the hardest part for you personally? The hardest part is probably uh, changing from my dead name to my preferred name. What's your dead name? Uh, my dead name is Mary Alice, or just Mary. And I changing from that to Max was a difficult process because some people didn't understand that it was more about feeling comfortable gender-wise than just, oh, I want to be called Max because it sounds cooler than Mary. Many of the kids here struggle with anxiety and depression. The rate of attempted suicide among transgender youth in particular is staggeringly high, four times higher than youth in general. Then there's simply the regular adolescent stuff on top of it all. At this activity, campers bury and burn former identities and insecurities. So it doesn't have to completely burn up, but you should get a good little burning going. 13-year-old Lilith Wall only half jokes she wants to get rid of her love for pasta. Improper yeah. mac and cheese ratio. Okay, we're giving it <laughs> That's amazing. At this point, Lilith identifies as a bisexual female, but her self-image fluctuates too, and that's been hard. What's the internal battle been? The internal battle will... Because everyone else seems so perfect, right? So, you know, you think everyone else is thinking about you whenever, like, you do something, right? Uh, so, yeah, and it, the reality is that everyone is too busy thinking about themselves to think about you. So, really, everyone's judging themselves and no one's actually judging each other. And that's, I, that's something I always have to remind myself. Okay, I'm going to get away from this. <laughs> Lack of judgment, safe space. They are constant mantras here. Everybody, this is a gay tutorial. <laughs> We're just starting. Tonight's rainbow dance is the first time many can express themselves this freely. The first time many are simply going to a dance as themselves. We're all bonded by like an integral part of us, uh, which is being in the queer community. A lot of these kids, like they could be the only out or the only queer kid in their like school that they know of, and um, just we're all bonded by that one thing. <laughs> Definitely outside because I feel like people are gonna look at me for wearing like wacky colors of makeup, but here it's like the norm to be whoever you are and however you want to express yourself. This is the first year the camp raised enough money, a hundred thousand dollars, to run two one week sessions. The money keeps the cost of a one-week session down to $350 a week or covers it entirely for kids who can't afford it. All right. Elbows in. Knees together. Knees together. Toes together. But there's not enough space for everyone who wants to come. The demand for a sense of belonging is striking. So is the joy in finding it. it makes you emotional. It does, you know. It just, it's, it makes it all worthwhile. You know, the, the hours that we put in trying to make camp successful, to get the funding, to get every, all our ducks in a row every year. And then you have these, you know, glimmers of, like, wow, the awe factor. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you think you're changing people's lives? Uh, yeah, we are. We can see it. Friends. Mm -hmm. As the years go by, mm -hmm. I'll think 
Bittersweet. I mean, I'm excited to go back home and see my dog, but I also don't want to leave these people. Oh, so, I love you, um, Matt. Yeah. Aww. I'll keep coming here as long as humanly possible. Hello, you. Oh my God! <laughs> Jesus. I didn't know you were coming so soon. I'm sorry. I have to get someone's signature. Oh, okay. All right. It's only five what? days, but Kate Gemelyanov says she hopes what her child brings home is more lasting. This is my mom. This is Alex. Nice to meet you. He's the, he's the best. Okay. Oh, the best. Awesome. Hi. 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 Nice yeah. to meet you. You're, you're everywhere. Yeah. Otherwise known as mom. This just seems like a really positive environment for the kids to just, you know, talk amongst themselves, talk to adults, and, and, and just, you know, try on different personas. Yeah, I think that that was the, the sense of possibility and just that the, the, the okayness that was really what, what Max took away from this. Oh, I missed you so much! Feeling accepted, Donna Sharon and Philip Wall say kids like their daughter don't take that for granted. You go have fun. Having it in this intimate environment, I think it's absolutely wonderful for the kids just to gain insight, have them answer some questions, give them something to think with some quiet time around them. I, and I yeah. think this experience specifically is very important because if anything, we need to teach our kids that they should be safe, that anything but that is unacceptable. So if you're in an environment that you're not, you don't feel safe or it's causing you anxiety, you're not supposed to be there. That's, that shouldn't be that way. If they don't realize at a young enough age that that isn't right, they tend to accept it, and that hurts them as a person, right? Because you're accepting something you shouldn't have to accept. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to be taking home more self-expression and many, many memories and new friendships. And now when I leave, I'm, I feel more like I can be myself out in public, right? I can express myself in a lot more ways. Is that good? Yeah, it feels really good. And that inner voice may be their most valuable guide as they keep defining their way. Joanna Rumiliotis, CBC News, Thessalon, Ontario. Extraordinary story. Straight ahead, a couple of red-hot winners, one on the movie screen and one on the tennis court. It's been 10 years since three young men from Mississauga launched a rock band called Triumph. They've learned the secret of turning heavy metal into gold. The journal's Russ Patrick joined Triumph on their 85 tour to discover the secret of success for these rockers on a roll. Triumph on their way to the Spectrum in Philadelphia. Both the arena and the moon are full. Tonight's night of full moon. Is it? Yes, full moon is a bit crazy. Mike Levine, bass guitar player, producer of Triumph's records. Gil Moore, drummer, director of Triumph's high-tech concerts. Rick Emmett, lead guitar, Triumph's master musician. After 10 years on the road, they've become one of the most successful touring bands in the rock business. They used to play small clubs in small towns. Now they play theaters and stadiums in large cities, mostly in the States. They'll gross more than $10 million from this year's tour. For five months of the year, touring is a way of life for Rick Emmett and Triumph. This sold out concert at the Spectrum in Philadelphia is just one of 94 no. stops on the 85 no. tour. For most rock bands, tours are money-losing promotion gimmicks tied to the release of new recordings. But for Triumph, tours turn a profit. Okay, everybody ready to go. Let's stand by and cue house lights. Two black in five, four, three, two, one.
Describing a Triumph concert as colorful is a massive understatement. Complete with laser light shows and onstage explosions, they're among the most technically sophisticated of any in the rock world. Some critics have said Triumph is a triumph of showbiz spectacle over musical substance. But drummer Gil Moore, who puts the show together, doesn't buy the all glitz, no substance criticism. With the technology that's available, it's possible to make a concert a really audio-visual extravaganza in the true sense of the word, and to enhance what you're doing musically. That is the key, is to enhance the music. The spectacle is called Arena Rock. It's what today's fans expect to see and hear in a touring rock show. When they're on the road, the Triumph Trio tours Thursday through Sunday. They spend the rest of the week at company headquarters in Mississauga near Toronto. Rock and roll is a fiercely competitive business, but Triumph has survived. Every day when I wake up, I realize there's another band that's, you know, a mile down the road that's coming along and uh, but you guys have survived for 10 years. Why? We're tough. <laughs> We're tough, you know? We fight hard, we fight clean, and uh, we've, uh, we've acquired skills. CBC Music presents the Canadian Music Class Challenge. Teachers, go to cbcmusic.ca slash music class and upload your students playing a selected song to enter. There you go, Dennis Shapovalov's tremendous run is not slowing down. Today in Davis Cup play, the 18-year-old took down his opponent from India in straight sets, helping Canada advance to the world group for the seventh consecutive year. The Toronto International Film Festival wrapped up today with awards and the top honour went to a movie that's already getting some Oscar buzz. And I'm very pleased to announce that the 2017 Gross People's Choice Award goes to Martin McDonough's Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Starring Francis McDormand, the film is a dark comedy about revenge and redemption in small town America. The People's Choice Award often goes on to be nominated at the Oscars. Now before we go tonight, a quick reminder of our top stories. Please take forceful action to protect the most persecuted minority in the world. Canadians call for action to stop the violence in Myanmar against Rohingyas. The UN and Ottawa both call it apparent ethnic cleansing and hard rhetoric. If the United States has to defend itself or defend its allies in any way, North Korea will be destroyed. In the wake of North Korea's latest provocative missile launch, Donald Trump launches another provocative tweet as world leaders seek unity against Pyongyang. That is The National for this Sunday night. For news anytime, always check our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Susan Ormiston. Thank you for watching.